So ladies and gentlemen, let's help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Bob Hoffman. Good afternoon, everybody. I must tell you that that might have been the weakest applause I've heard in a long time. I think you can do better if you get stood up. So how about a standing ovation? Come on, stand up. Step up to your greatness. Okay, louder, come on, a little energy, a little energy. Thank you. That was very heartfelt and very spontaneous. As you adapted, you see how there's always the next gear? And that's an important lesson. By the way, in standing up, you also learn the first rule of success. You have to get off your ass. So I want to shift in the conversation with you by tying together our history and our future. I'm a chiropractic historian. I study the history. I'm very proud to be a chiropractor. But I believe we have to adapt to fit in properly in the future. And I also believe it's possible to adapt without giving up our history and our heritage. And that's what I want to talk about with you today. So B.J. Palmer was both loved and despised because every August at Lyceum at Palmer College, he basically reinvented chiropractic. And some people loved that it kept changing and improving, and some people got put off by it. You know, he went from full spine diversified Merrick system to upper cervical specific with a stable table to a drop table. Early on in his writings, he talked about correcting the subluxation to open up the occlusion, free the nerve. Later on in his writings, towards the end of his life, he talked about the fact that the purpose of an adjustment was to raise consciousness. And somehow, in 1961, when he passed away, our profession pretty much got frozen in time. And I think that that's silly and unnecessary. And I think if he were alive today, we might not recognize what chiropractic is. And I want to make that shift. So I want to start off with a, a rather bold and significant statement. I'm a subluxationist. Are you? I told the subluxation story in my practice all day, every day, to every patient if they wanted to hear it or not. I think it's a great story. I'm proud of the story. I'm articulate about the story. As a profession, we've told the subluxation story for 120 years. And less than 10% of the population gets it. And I believe that if we want to engage far more people under chiropractic care, we don't need to give up subluxation, in fact, over my dead body. But I do think we need a different story. And I want to share that with you. So let's get back to this whole consciousness of adapting. If we look at our history and our philosophy, we recognize that Chiropractic Philosophy 101 says when the body adapts to its external and internal stressors, it's in a state of ease. When we fail to adapt, we go into a state of dis-ease, and if we continue to fail to adapt, we go to a state of disease. Stress test. Every one of us has heard about the stress test, and yet most people really don't know what it is. So let me share it with you. You go to a facility, they take your resting heart rate, the test has not started. They put you on a treadmill, they get you to walk on a level treadmill for a few moments, the test has not started yet. They increase the speed, then they increase the inclination of the treadmill. The test has not started yet. They get your heart rate to go from about 70 beats a minute to over 200. 
the test has not started yet. They take you off the treadmill and they sit you down. Now the test is about to start. They want to see how quickly or how slowly your heart returns to normal. If it returns to normal quickly, you're healthy. If it takes a long time to return to normal, you have a problem. That's about adapting. Do we adapt quickly or slowly? This is an innate mechanism, but it's sometimes slowed down when we're in a state of dis-ease. We know from our history that there's physical, chemical, and emotional stress. Dee Dee Palmer called it the three T's, thoughts, toxins, and traumas. Of the three, we have spent the majority of our time on the physical stress. We've spent a good chunk of the time on the chemical stress, and we pretty much have ignored the emotional stress. And I hate to break it to you, but emotional stress is the cause of most people's problems. In spite of that, we still produce miracles. So my point is not to make wrong what we've done. What we've done has been miraculous. It's been amazing. But I believe we could do better. Do you believe that? Yes or yes, do you believe that? So let's talk about that a little bit. I believe that every one of your patients knows that they're chronically stressed. They're under constant chronic low levels of stress. What they don't know is how it's impacting their lives and their health. Would you agree with that statement? Would you? You're going to have to play along. Yes or yes? So what do we do about this? And how do we deal with it? Well, I believe that the quality of our life is controlled by the quality of the questions we ask. If you look at a case history form in chiropractic, we haven't had a new question in 60 years. We've had incestuous case history forms. You have a senior intern, you copy theirs. Someone comes into your office, they copy yours. And let me break it to you. The world is different than it was 60 years ago. Perhaps we need some new questions. Questions to understand the patient, number one, but questions also to change the trajectory of the relationship. I have over 35 new case history questions. I'm going to share maybe four or five with you this, today. I want to just take a step back before I dive into this. I want to point out to you that we're not in the healthcare business. We're not in the chiropractic business. We're not in finding the correcting the subluxation business. We're not in the wellness business. Please write this down. You're in three interrelated businesses. And once we understand which of those three interrelated businesses that we're in, practice shifts. It adapts. It changes. It's a game changer. Here are the three interrelated businesses that you're in. Number one, please write these down. Number one, you're in the relationship business. Everything in life rises and falls on relationships. People love to do business with people they love. The second business that you're in, you're in the solutions business. People have a problem, you have a solution, they love to have a relationship with you. And the third business that you're in is the changing the beliefs business. People have crazy freaking beliefs about health and sickness. Like the flu virus is traveling up the highway, coming to your town as we speak. And if we don't change some of those beliefs, game over, you lose, but so does the patient. Now when you start to see everything about your practice through the lens of those three businesses, I assure you, your practice will grow. So let's start looking at some of these questions. First question. Where in your body do you currently hold or carry your stress? Let me ask you, just a show of hands, does anybody here know where in their body they hold and carry their stress? Raise your hand. Raise it high, please. Can I just ask you to tell me where? Your shoulders, same. Stomach, same. These, this is like um, Noah's Ark, two by two we go in. Yes? Say it again. Your jaw, great. Anybody else? Anybody else different areas? Say again. Your stomach? Everywhere. Thank you, Rick. Here are the most common answers. My head, 
my neck, my shoulders, my jaw, my chest, my stomach, my lower back, my feet. Could any of you relate to that? Let me tell you why this is such an enormous question. When you ask your patients, where in your body do you currently hold to carry your stress, everyone has an answer. It doesn't matter. As much as I'd like to know it's in your stomach versus your shoulders, that's not the reason I'm asking. First, you get the patient to admit, I have stress. And even more important, you get them to acknowledge, maybe for the very first time, the connection that, holy crap, it's affecting my body. I even know where. Now, if I'm in practice and someone says to me, in response to this question, where do you hold to carry your stress? And they go, my shoulders. I don't stop there. I want to dig in. I want to ask. This is the beginning. How long have you noticed that? When is it at its worst? Is it physical stress, chemical stress, or emotional stress, or all of the above? Is there a secondary place you feel it in your body? This begins to change the relationship. Next question. What tools have you used to reduce the stress that you feel? Now, I find that people fall into two categories. One category says, well, I go to Pilates, I take yoga, I work out in the gym, I meditate, I'm now going to become a patient here. Awesome. Another category, unfortunately a much bigger category, says this. I drink too much, I smoke too much, I eat too much. But those are all ways to modulate their stress, isn't it? So I want to know that. Here's another question. Is stress an external problem or an internal response to an external problem? Now, we know the answer, but they don't. They've never considered that. And this, again, is a game changer, because once the patient realizes that how I react to stress is my choice, they immediately win back control. Another question. Why do you think your body failed to heal itself this time? What an enormous question. And you're going to be shocked that 80% of your patients have an answer. Here's one of my favorites. Do you know that science has referred to the spine as the motor that drives the brain? Of course their answer is no, but it gives you a platform to talk about it. Now these are just four or five of 35 questions that I have. And I'm not ex asking anyone to rip up their case history form and take 35 new questions. But what I am asking you to do, based on your own level of comfort, is to adapt and start to change the game and change the conversation. Is this good so far? Are you liking this? Please, keep that to a minimum. Startling. OK, next. Here's a great question for you. Mrs. Smith, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate an average day of stress in your life? I'm not asking about your best day or your worst day, but when you factor in physical, chemical, and emotional stress, and all the subsets of emotional stress, time, money, relationships, health, how would you rate an average day of stress? What do you think the most common answers are? I, I heard someone here. Eight, thank you. Well, who else? Seven. Great answers. Over 80% of the people are between seven and eight. Awesome. Very awesome. Now again, when someone says to me, well, Dr. Bob, my level of stress on an average day is probably between seven and eight, I don't sit there and just jot it down in my notes. I have to respond. And here would be a typical response. Really? That concerns me. The brain and nervous system was never designed to handle chronically that intense level of stress without damage, deterioration, and disease. You think I have their attention now? See how this is a different conversation and a different game? Some history of stress research. In the 1920s, the world's preeminent physiologist was Walter Cannon. Walter Cannon headed up the Department of Physiology at Harvard. Walter Cannon wrote a famous book called The Wisdom of the Body. Walter Cannon coined two phrases, homeostasis and fight-flight. And what Cannon basically said in The Wisdom of the Body, 
is that it's overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system that is the ultimate cause of all disease. About 30 years later in Canada, the father of stress research, Hans Selye, who wrote The Stress of Life, basically concluded that humans suffer from chronic activation of their sympathetic nervous system. About 20 years later, back at Harvard, Herbert Benson discovered that it's chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system is the cause of all disease and that we have to develop and work on the relaxation response, which is the name of his book. So medicine has known the problem for almost 100 years. They just don't have any answers for it. You do. You do. The National Institute of Health, a very conservative American governmental body, says that up to 90% of all illness is related to stress. They also went on to say that over 90% of all visits to medical doctors in the United States is as a result of stress. Now, if you dig deeper, what they tell you is the other 10% is genetics, which is genetic stress. What they fail to tell you is the iatrogenic problem. And this is dramatically different and far worse than it was just a few years ago because we live in a fast-paced, high-tech, high-stress world. Would you agree with that? Let me give you an example. Who here has a smartphone? Raise your hand high. And I know J Chris just spoke about this. Keep your hands up. I know Chris just spoke about this. If you misplaced it, would you go into an epileptic freaking seizure? <laughs> and let me give you another example. If you texted me and I didn't respond in like 3.8 seconds, you think I don't like you anymore. <laughs> we live in a fast-paced, high-tech, high-stress world. So the phraseology is constant, chronic, low levels of stress. It's important to realize that no one is immune, and this includes each of us. Chronic stress has propelled us into the earliest stages of the worst epidemic in human history, the neurologic epidemic. And why we need to shift towards a brain-based model is because a chiropractic brain-based model is the answer to this predicament, this neurologic epidemic. Let's discuss why. Do you realize and recognize that ever-growing lists of people are now suffering from Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, insomnia, lupus, multiple sclerosis, acid reflux, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, anxiety, migraines, depression, and the list goes on and on and on. Unfortunately, there's very little medicine could do for this. Medicine does amazing things, not for neurological problems. In fact, every attempt they've made, they've made it worse. This is getting worse, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to continue to get worse. It's picking up steam. I wish I had enough time to tell you what some of the experts predict relative to these diseases and the rate of incidence over the next 10 and 20 years. We're in an ep a neurological epidemic. Let's go further. Please recognize that all forms of stress, physical, chemical, and emotional, are ultimately brain stress. Because we live our life through our brain and our nervous system. We factor and filter everything through our brain and our nervous system. So all forms of stress are brain stress. And prolonged, constant brain stress causes a sympathetic, parasympathetic imbalance, which creates a neurological cascade of events, which puts us in something I like to refer to as a sympathetic survival syndrome. Now, I, I get it. Some of you are thinking, but I really can't talk to my patients about sympathetic, parasympathetic. Those are confusing words. I'm going to simplify it for you, but I can tell you unequivocally, you can talk to them about it. This is not complicated, and they get it. Give them credit. More than 2 billion people today worldwide are suffering from brain-based health challenges. And this represents a significant, a gigantic window of opportunity for you to build, grow your practice, and rebrand the chiropractic profession. You ready to hear more about that? 
We'll try that again. I thought we rehearsed three or four times already. Are you ready to hear more about that? Yes. Much better. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. Imbalances between our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous system is the cause of all disease physically and mentally. That is a well-researched, extremely bold, and totally true statement. Make note of that. This is where you should be doing a photo op. Or this. When the brain goes out of balance, the body always follows. Now this is confusing for people, because when the brain goes out of balance and the body follows, it has lots of different names. Some people sometimes call it high blood pressure, and others call it insomnia, and someone else might call it eczema, and someone yet might call, call it irritable bowel syndrome, and someone might call it low back pain, but they all come from the same thing. The brain went out of balance, sympathetic, parasympathetic shift, causing the body to shift. Now the good news is, when we can get the brain to go back into balance, the body always follows. But this is less confusing because it only has one name. It's called healing. And I contend that the reason chiropractic for 120 years has gotten such amazing clinical results with such a wide range of ailments is because if we understood it or not, realized it or not, or articulated it or not, we got the brain to go back into balance and the body healed itself. This is really cool stuff. Your sympathetics are for survival and your parasympathetics are for healing. That's a critical distinction. Patients get that. So if your sympathetics are for survival and your parasympathetics are for healing, Stress keeps us trapped in survival and disconnected from the ability to heal. When we're in survival, our ability to heal, grow, learn, love, or even flourish is greatly reduced. What area of the spine, when you adjust it, would stimulate the sympathetics and what area of the spine would stimulate the parasympathetics? This is an important thing to now understand if what we're trying to do is stimulate parasympathetic function. Anyone know? Well, let me tell you the answer. When you adjust the cranium, the upper cervical spine, or the sacrum are the only three parts of our structural anatomy that stimulates parasympathetic function. How interesting. Changes how you look at patients. Fight, flight, defense physiology, or sympathetic survival syndrome always causes the body to innately respond by doing this. Heart rate increases, blood pressure increases, blood sugar increases, respiration increases, perspiration increases, pupils dilate, secretion of cortisol, adrenaline, and epinephrine is turned up and turned on. Always. That's normal. But the stress is supposed to stop, and that stops. When we're under constant, chronic, low levels of stress, what happens is our brain and our nervous system marinates in cortisol, which is extremely damaging. Prolonged stress without the appropriate relaxation response causes a weakening of the heart, shrinkage of the brain, and inflammation, which prevents formation of new nerve cells. All sickness, disease, and behavioral problems begin with brain imbalance as a result of chronic stress. So we have to ask some difficult questions. Is vertebral subluxation a cause or an effect? It's both. It could be both. And does structure really determine function? Occasionally, but far more often, function determines structure. Some chiropractic history of brain function. Dee Dee Palmer and Harvey Lillard's healing, hearing. We all know that Harvey got adjusted and his hearing was restored. And there's been a controversy in our profession for about 100 years. Did Dee Dee adjust the upper cervical spine or the fifth thoracic? And you know what? It's a bad question, because there's no good answers to a bad question. The answer is, it doesn't matter. Neither one has a nerve that goes to the hearing mechanism. What he did was reboot the brain of Harvey Lillard, and his hearing was restored. B.J. Palmer in the Electroencephaloneuromantipograph, say that three times fast. 
BJ was checking the nerve pathways and the communication neurologically from brain to body. The safety pin cycle. These are all part of our history and our heritage. BJ Palmer in the Clearview Sanitarium, where he took care of emotionally disabled people and got phenomenal results. Do you recognize that the first specialty council in the history of the chiropractic profession was in the early 1940s and it was on mental health in chiropractic? And one of the textbooks I studied from when I was in chiropractic college, which made no sense to me 40 years ago, was Mental Health in Chiropractic by Dr. Schwartz. This has been around, we've just forgotten it. How is it possible that all chiropractic techniques work? How is it possible that we could do FIA technique, you know what that is, it's Logan, finger and ass, right? Or we could toggle the atlas, or use an instrument, or do full spine diversified, or network, or Corin specific technique, or SOT. How could they all work? Well, there's only one common denominator. They all rebalance the brain. Chiropractic is a neuromusculoskeletal science. I've never seen it once that it was a musculoskeletal neuroscience, because the neuro comes first. And I get that there are some people in our profession that are trying to quietly eliminate the neuro and just refer to us as musculoskeletal over my dead body and I hope over yours. The new story of chiropractic takes us above relieving nerve pressure. We do that, but even more important, we normalize and maximize brain function. It's time to realize and communicate that pain hurts, but stress kills. Are you willing to adapt? Experts in our profession like Carrick, Barwell, Melillo, Gonzalez, Dispenza, and experts outside of our profession like Amen, Hyman, and Porter have been leading the charge for brain-based wellness for years. The brain and nervous system could easily change for better or for worse. A brain that refires together, rewires together to effectively reset, rewire, and reboot the brain requires a simple formula of frequency over time. That's how we need to develop our schedules of care. We as a profession have been so battered about this issue of overutilization that it's my observation that we now under-recommend. And we need to get better. The key is not to do either. The key is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The truth. Would you agree with that? We could reestablish brain balance and neutralize stress with deep meditation. Unfortunately, most people don't do that, and even when they do meditate, they don't do it deeply enough. You could reestablish brain function with rhythmic breathing. All forms of breathing techniques tell us that however long you breathe in, you should breathe out twice as long. So if you're breathing in with your nose to the count of four, you breathe out with your mouth to the count of eight. You know why? Inspiration through your nose stimulates the sympathetics, Expiration through your mouth stimulates parasympathetics. That's why that works. Proper exercise like walking, being in nature, belly laughter, deep delta sleep, new light and sound technology like the MindFit that's out at my booth in the expo, and of course, proper chiropractic care are all methods to get the brain to go back into balance. There are four dysfunctions of the brain. Please make note of this. People are either under-aroused, over-aroused, unstable, or exhausted. I'm going to cover them rather quickly. If someone's under-aroused, some of the major symptoms that they're going to have will be poor concentration, low energy, constipation, limited attention span, irritability, and depression. What do you think this is going to do to their posture? Well, they tend to have mushy muscle tone, and they tend to have that condition called no acetol where they're just kind of walking like that, you know? <laughs> the second dysfunction is over-arousal. Completely different set of symptoms. Cold hands and feet, tight muscles, anxiety, restless sleep, racing mind, irritable bowel, high blood pressure, accelerated aging, teeth grinding. And what does that do to the posture? Rigid spine, tight muscles, forward display skull in the attack mode. 90% of your patients are in this category. 
unstable. They bounce back and forth between under and over aroused. On any visit, they could be either. Excuse me, it went too fast. Some symptoms may include headaches, seizures, hot flashes, food sensitivities, eating disorders, bipolar personality, mood swings. And the worst and most damaging, which will come from any of the first three if they're there long enough, is an exhausted brain, which is where all of our serious diseases come from. Who knows who this individual is? Henry Kissinger. We have been taught as chiropractors to look at the posture of the body. I'm going to suggest that in addition to that, we need to look at the posture of the face. Is one of his eyes smaller and more almond-shaped and lower where there's ptosis taking place? This is the side of brain dysfunction. And look at his face. One side has big jowl, the other side is smaller. Now, you might think it's because he's an older gentleman. Who's this guy? Kiefer Sutherland. Is one eye bigger or smaller? Look at his face. Look at the distortions in his face. So when the brain is out of balance, the face and the spine are the best indicators of that distortion. Three major advancements in chiropractic in the last five years. We need to change the frequency, duration, and intensity of our adjustment based on which form of brain dysfunction people have. Number two, we should be adjusting mostly one side of the spine, the side opposite dysfunction. And three, if someone's problem is mostly emotional, spend majority of your time from the mid-dorsals up because there are three emotional centers and they're all from the mid-dorsals up, the brain, the thyroid, and the heart. If their problem is usually physical, it's usually below that. Proper chiropractic adjustments create a functional reorganization in the brain and make the connections between the cells more robust. It interrupts the current inappropriate neurological patterns. The adjustment improves brain function, risk evaluation, languaging skills, motivation, thinking, memory, quality of life, while we reduce stress, inflammation, muscle tone, and pain. Chiropractic adjustments reboot, defrag, synchronize, and harmonize brain function. The pur purpose of chiropractic care is to normalize and maximize brain function. All stress creates brain imbalance, which, and chiropractic care rebalances the brain. The miracles that chiropractic is famous for is a result of the adjustment which resets, rebalances, and reestablishes normal brain function. Does this help you? Does this make a lot of sense for you? So just one or two last things, and then I'm going to be done. Get this quote. Align the brain and the body. Your brain is the control system of the body. Brain balance and harmony is essential to overall well-being and optimal cognitive, emotional, and physical performance. Once the brain is balanced, the body always follows. This condition is called homeostasis. Once you achieve homeostasis, you will enjoy new states of self-regulation and relaxation, allowing you to think more clearly, perform more successfully, and experience a higher degree of hope and happiness. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we all want? So I hope this presentation was helpful. I hope it gave you some clarity. I will tell you that I just finished writing a new book called Awaken Their Flourishing Brain. If you'd like a free copy, please come and see me between aisles 400 and 500. And um, in addition to attending all the Parker seminars, which I totally recommend and endorse, in early October, I have a big conference taking place in October. 17 speakers, 14 of them are on brain function and chiropractic. I love and appreciate you. Let's keep growing together and let's keep adapting. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.